Hey everybody, I'm Mark, and today I'm going to show you three different ways using three different sets of tools to make these magnetic knife holders. The first step in all three ways is to cut the workpiece to size and make sure they're square. This piece of black walnut is actually left over from a toothbrush holder I made last summer. It was the first project I did on a CNC machine. I clamped the workpiece to the wasteboard, then set the machine up to start cutting. After setting the X and Y positions to their starting point by eye, I used a Z probe to allow the machine to detect the surface of the workpiece. This way all the cut depths will be precise. Then that's pretty much it. I just turn on the spindle and press play. With the machine running in the background, I was able to move on to the other methods of construction, but for the sake of telling a cohesive story, I'll finish this one before moving on. If you have an X-Carve and would like to make this project yourself, I'll leave a link to the easel file in the description. If you don't have an X-Carve but you're curious about them, I'll leave a link to where you can go and learn some more. I used the tabs feature in easel to keep the workpiece from walking away once the cut went all the way through to the bottom. Obviously, in this specific case, they don't do any good on the sides here because there's no extra material for them to connect to. So I made sure to add enough tabs that they stayed connected on the ends where the clamps held the material down. I removed the board, then cleaned up the tabs on my belt sander. I used a quarter inch bit in the X-Carve to remove the material faster, but this left the magnet pockets with rounded corners, so I quickly used a chisel to square them up so that my bar magnets would fit snugly in place. I put a little bit of epoxy in each of the four pockets, then pushed in the magnets using a dowel. Then I set the whole thing face down on a metal surface, which let the magnets act as their own clamps while the epoxy set up. I drilled holes for some set screws in the bottom. Unfortunately, my camera died during that operation, but all you really need is to make sure that the screws stick into the void. This is how the board will attach to the wall, and I'll show you how that works at the end. After a little sanding, I threw on some tongue oil. All this beauty needs now is a mounting strip, but we'll deal with that when we finish the other boards. Method number two uses a router table to cut the groove. In order to get the router bit into the material, I needed to drill starting and ending holes first. With the workpiece already cut to final size, I drew a center line in the back, then marked the locations for these holes. I put an eighth inch spacer on my drill press table, then lowered the Forstner bit until the tip just barely touched it. This way I could set the depth stop on the drill press to leave exactly the amount of material I needed on the face. I used that same spacer to mark a reference line on the outside of the board so I could see exactly how deep the holes would be. I fired up the drill press and I drilled the holes. With a half inch spiral bit in the router table, I slipped one of the holes over it to hold the workpiece in line. Then I slid the fence up so it was contacting the entire length of the workpiece and I tightened it down. I drew a line on the fence to mark the starting point, then shifted the board to the outfeed side of the table and set up a stop block. From this point, it was just a matter of lining up the board on the starting point and very carefully lowering it down over the bit. Then I slid it over until I hit the stop block and shut off the machine. After each little step, I would mark where the bit was so I could see how much I was raising it up before each pass. This way, I could be sure I wasn't trying to take too big of a bite at once. After about three passes, I could raise the bit up to that line that I drew earlier, marking the final depth. One thing to note at this point, this depth matches the point at the center of the Forstner bit, but not the flat bottom of the hole. So when sliding the workpiece onto the router bit, it seems to bottom out, but it needs to drop about another eighth inch before it's actually sitting flat on the table. I put epoxy in the full length of the resulting channel and carefully set the magnets in place. Unlike the CNC version, this one doesn't have partitions to keep the magnets separate, so I was very careful to bring each additional magnet in from the side to keep them from snapping together and making a mess or pinching my fingers. Each one of these bar magnets is rated to hold about 33 pounds, so make sure to be careful with them because their finger pinching ability is off the charts. Another word of caution, neodymium or rare earth style magnets are actually pretty brittle, so be sort of gentle with them. If you drop one and it breaks, it will fracture a lot like glass and they will have really sharp edges. The rest is the same as before. Let the magnets hold themselves down until the epoxy hardens, drill mounting holes in the bottom, sand and apply finish.
For what I'm calling the drill press method, I start with a similar size workpiece, but it needs to be just about a blade thickness wider, and I left mine long so I had some wiggle room that I could use to fine tune the size later. I cut an eighth inch thick piece off the front face using the table saw. I cleaned up the saw marks on the resulting thick and thin pieces using my drum sander because it was easiest for me, but you could also use a palm sander or a card scraper if you need to. Starting from the front side of the thick piece, I drilled a hole and tested my magnet to make sure it sat just below the surface. Then, I proceeded to drill a total of 10 holes and just eyeballed the spacing. Once again, I had a technical failure and my camera failed to capture this step in progress. Flipping over to the back side, I drilled a hole at a depth that stopped just short of going through to the holes on the other side. Then, I proceeded to hog out lots of material by skipping a space about half the size of my bit, then stepping back to clear that out. By leapfrogging like this, the point of the Forstner bit is always going into solid material and not spinning around in open air. If you tried to cut with just the edge of the bit, it would have a tendency to wander and not drill straight down. After working the arm on the drill press enough to give myself tennis elbow, I was left with a sawtooth edged hole that had a cool design in the bottom. Back on the front side, I dropped magnets into each of the holes, making sure to hold down each one while I brought new ones in from the side. This technique kept them from jumping back out of the holes and slamming into each other. Then I slathered on a bunch of wood glue and put the strip I cut off earlier on top of the magnets. I used as many clamps as I could fit on it in order to close the gap all the way around and essentially hide the seam within the grain of the wood. After declamping, I cut the extra chunk off and squared the opposite end. Then, I sanded, drilled holes, and finished just like before. To mount it to the wall, you just need a strip of wood that fits inside the channel on the back. In my case, I had to put a drywall anchor in the left side, then I could level the strip and run a screw into the stud behind it on the right side. Then the board just slides on top, much like hanging a floating shelf. So when you go to make these mounting strips, there's actually a little game of back and forth that you have to play between the length that you think it needs to be and um, adjustability. If you make it the exact width of your slot, you don't have a whole lot of room to work with, but if you make it shorter than that, you have the ability to kind of fine tune the position of this by sliding back and forth. Now, I didn't make it very short because I knew exactly where I needed this to be. Um, but you could make this a couple of inches shorter and have lots of room to move this back and forth before you put the set screws in from the bottom and lock it in place. So I've just got a little bit of slop in mine, and the reason for that is I wanted to line these up perfectly together so I can get them pretty close and then hit it with a level and see if we're on. And it looks like, nope, bottom's got to go over just a little bit. There. And now these two edges are perfectly plumb with each other. So I can just take my little set screws. And for this lower one, I have it going in from the bottom. <clears throat> because I'm not short enough to get down low and look up and see it. So it's pretty well hidden. And then from the top, I have the set screws coming in down from the top because there's no way I'm tall enough to see those holes from up there. Now with this design you can obviously customize it to do just about anything you want it to. If you want it to be a whole lot longer all you would have to do is buy more magnets and make it longer. You could do it out of different types of wood. Whatever you want to make it fit the style of your kitchen. But you don't have to just do it in the kitchen too. You could make stuff like this for the shop to hold up chisels and screwdrivers and all sorts of things. So I think that's really all I wanted to point out about this. Now I'm sure most of you are going to wonder where I got the magnets. I'll make sure to leave links to those down in the description as well as links to my uh, website and to Inventables and where you can learn about the X-Carve. Also, uh, if you weren't aware, I have a Patreon account that you can go and check out through uh, the link down in the description. And now I feel like I'm rambling, so I'm going to let you guys go. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you next time.